Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Brahim Aude. Iran, the U.S. and the Middle East, our topic uh, for this uh, program. And we have uh, Professor Faride Farhi, uh, who will uh, be sharing with us her thoughts about uh, the topic. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Faride, for uh, coming. Uh, you are an independent scholar and also affiliate to graduate faculty at the Un uh, University of Hawaii Political Science Department. So uh, we before have uh, um, discussed um, matters relating to Iran and the U.S.-Iran uh, nuclear deal. Actually, it's five plus one. You can tell us what that means. And the uh, nuclear deal. So perhaps before we go forward, what happened? has happened or been happening after the nuclear deal um, to remind us about uh, the significance and the importance perhaps of the nuclear deal um, between Iran and the five plus one, primarily the, uh, the U.S. Okay. Um, five plus one, five permanent members of United Nations plus Germany um, negotiated with Iran for almost two years and eventually they reached an agreement that limits Iran's nuclear program in terms of um, the level of enrichment that they can engage in. Um, um, it ships out a stockpile, large stockpiles of uh, enriched uranium that Iran had, as well as puts Iran under a rather int intrusive inspection regime uh, in exchange for uh, the agreement that United States as well as other countries, uh, particularly European Union, would uh, uh, lift uh, what is called nuclear-related sanctions. Um, that happened uh, about 18 months ago. Then it took a few months for Iran to fulfill its side of its uh, uh, commitment, namely, you know, ship out enriched uranium. So since January of this year, 2016, the implementation stage uh, has begun, which means um, that Iran has fulfilled its commitment. Since then, the International Atomic Energy Agency has gone inside Iran and confirmed that Iran has um, uh, um, 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 fulfilled its commitment under the agreement. European Re Union has lifted its sanction. United States has suspended some important elements uh, 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 of its sanctions regime. Uh, but the reality is that United States also has many sanctions that have been congressionally mandated and furthermore are non-nuclear sanctions. Mm -hmm. So what has happened is um, that Iran has, for example, benefited from um, the fact that it's been able to increase its oil exports. Um, um, it's almost back to the pre-sanctions level pre-nuclear sanctions level mm -hmm. going back to 2010. Um, uh, shipping and insurance uh, sanctions have been lifted, so now ships are actually boarding and taking um, um, uh, oil out of Iran. So that uh, component has been very useful in terms of Iranian economy. However, because United States also has a whole slew of very, very intricate sanctions, financial sanctions, if countries um, um, uh, engage uh, in dollars with Iran um, that has to do with um, quote-unquote terrorism as well as human rights violations in Iran, what you see is that a lot of major banks are quite hesitant to enter the Iranian economy. Um, and this is significant because obviously in order for foreign investment to go inside Iran, it requires uh, uh, banking support and letters of credit and so on. So it took a very long period of time for some of those kinks to be worked out. And even still today, you do not see any major bank being you know, yet uh, taking a step to actually um, give support to major corporations that might actually want to invest in Iran. But today, actually, there was an announcement that um, 
um, um, um, uh, the French giant oil company, Total, um, uh, has entered the consortium with the Chinese, uh, Sempec, uh, and Iranian companies to enter a particular gas field uh, um, in Iran. Total used to be in that area, um, uh, but because of the sanctions left, this is a multi-billion dollar field. And again, you know, obviously we are waiting to see how this financial dynamics are going to work. So the reality of the situation is that uh, um, uh, this agreement is working in terms of um, its intention to limit Iran's nuclear program um, um, and um, providing an inspection regime that is much more intrusive. And it's working to some extent in terms of lifting of sanctions, but uh, the economic benefits of this lifting of sanctions has been slow to come in relationship to Iran because of this very, very intricate uh, um, um, uh, set of regulations that are constantly being revised by uh, the Treasury Department in the United States. It's very important to understand that major banks in Europe, like Paribas, were fined up to something like $7 billion mm -hmm. for their engagement, not only with Iran, but also with Iran. Um, so they are very, very careful because it is not exactly clear what they are allowed to do. And the United Obama administration has been unwilling to actually write it down on paper um, exactly what the banks can do and cannot do. So the Europe, and of course the American banks are still by the kind of laws that exist, cannot go inside Iran. You know, even American citizens cannot engage in kind of a lot of activities with Iran. So um, the Europeans or banks are saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, uh, Secretary Kerry goes to the banks in Europe and say, you know, you don't have any limitations to go and work with the Iranians. And they come and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, you're not clarifying exactly what those limitations are. And since your banks are not going into Iran, we yet do not have the kind of confidence that is needed that we will not be slapped with um, um, further fines. And this is especially true because there is uncertainty about the American election. Um, obviously, one candidate in the election has said that he's going to scrap the deal, although people uh, think that he would not be able to do so. And, uh, and um, as, uh, Hillary Clinton has said that she will abide by the deal. However, it's not exactly clear whether or not she would be as willing as President Obama has been to veto uh, attempted congressional um, um, action to bring back some of the nuclear sanctions that were scrapped uh, under other guises. Because if they do that, then that's a violation of the agreement. Uh, and everybody, not only Iran, but also other players that engaged in that deal uh, would be faced with a very difficult situation. So that uncertainty has also prevented um, a sort of a full-fledged lifting of sanctions or the impact, a positive impact of lifting of sanctions. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, you mentioned uh, a few things. Uh, one is that uh, Iran uh, was slow to, um, you know, implement uh, her side of the bargain. Uh, so no, no, it was not slow. Iran actually did it much faster than mm. expected. You know, the Iran side of the bargain was to reduce the stockpile mm. of enriched uranium that it had, mm. as well as put into mothball a whole series of centrifuges, mm. not destroy them, but mm. mothball mm. them, and also redesign, or uh, Iran also has a heavy water reactor. None of these are weaponized programs. Mm. This is a nuclear energy program. So um, uh, it took a while to do all those things. And in fact, people did not expect uh, that Iran would be able to do it that fast. It effectively did it in four or five months. So the expectation was for Iran to take much longer. But the Iranians apparently were preparing uh, and had made the decision to move in that direction. So once the agreement was signed in the summer, they moved full-fledged and in a relatively short period of time for the task that was supposed to be done, 
uh, they managed to do all those things, ship out. Um, they even sold um, some of the heavy water that they had produced in one of the rea in the major reactor, heavy reactor to United States, because that was part of the agreement for that heavy water to be shipped out of Iran. Um, uh, another uh, bigger chunks of enriched uranium, different levels, um, uh, were shipped out to yeah. Russia. Good. I'm glad you clarified that point because uh, you mentioned like it took a uh, certain yeah. amount of time to do mm -hmm. that. It's because you needed that uh, exactly. preparation. Yeah. Exactly. It's not like, you know, there's no, no, uh, no, 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 no. No, good exactly. intentions, bad intentions. No, no, yeah, no, yeah. No, no, okay, no, no, so no. I'm, I'm glad we clarified that. that. That's why I say that um, the International Atomic um, um, Agency, IAEA, has uh, gone into Iran several mm -hmm. times since the agreement and has effectively said that Iran has fulfilled its mm -hmm. obligation on time based um, on the schedule that they yeah. have, um, um, yeah. the agreement right. effectively uh, has put forth. Right. Uh, the other clarification that uh, the Iranian program was not a weaponized program, it was energy. Absolutely, absolutely. That goes <clears throat> back to, you know, even, uh, you know, uh, 2003 National Intelligence Estimate. Uh, um, U.S. Intelligence. Uh, U U U.S. Actually, it was 2007. Uh, intelligence <laughs> Estimates suggested that Iran um, um, did not have a, a um, weaponized program. Um, um, and, you know, the, the possibility that they put in terms of intention of having a weaponized program was as late as 2003, mm -hmm. but had said that it did not have mm -hmm. that since then. Um, and, um, you know, um, um, you know, despite the fact that uh, um, um, tremendous attempt was made to find sites or find uh, aspects of program that would suggest that direction, uh, there was really uh, no evidence. And effectively, uh, the most that people could say eventually was that Iran was creating a program that would make it capable to become weaponized if they chose to do so. Mm -hmm. But um, even the CIA said that as far as the evidence is concerned, the Iranian leadership had not made the decision to do so. Now, in order to address that question, eventually, you know, the Iranian supreme leader came out and said, came out with this notion that Islam forbids nuclear weapons, you know, issued a religious edict that mm -hmm. essentially said that, um, uh, so put himself in a public relation um, 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 box in the sense that if he was going to flip later on, uh, you know, um, in front of his own population, he would be faced, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in difficult. It would be difficult. Would be difficult yeah. It would be a right. difficult situation. So that essentially became that commitment on the part of Iran that, but religiously, Iran mm -hmm. effectively took that notion that the Iranians mm -hmm. um, um, <clears throat> are intent on building a nuclear weapon uh, off the table. Mm -hmm. um, the negotiations were intended always to lengthen the time Iran has to produce a nuclear bomb by limiting uh, the amount of enriched uranium and uh, the extent to which that uranium is enriched. So yeah. now the claim is that um, the time Iran would need to actually produce a nuclear bomb, given the limited nature mm -hmm. of the enriched uranium that it has, and the fact that, that the enriched uranium that it has is below 5% enriched, it will take a year to produce. A year. A year. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think those are you know, those are silly arguments mm -hmm. in the sense that if there was intent to produce a nuclear weapon, any country can go full-fledged, especially a country that is so technologically um, um, advanced um, as Iran. You know, Pakistan has done it. Other countries have done it. Korea is doing it, North Korea. So it's not something that the Iranians cannot do, mm -hmm. is the question of um, um, politically whether or not they see that as something um, 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 that they want to do or not. And that decision, uh, they made the decision to actually use their nuclear program 
um, as a leverage to engage with the United States in order to effectively lift the sanctions. And the agreement runs for how many years? Ten? Well, the, yeah, the agreement has different um, uh, sort of um, uh, benchmarks, you mm. know, 10 years, 15 years in terms of, you know, because there are also limitations, for example, on Iran's um, 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 <clears throat> Um, um, sales of um, um, arms to Iran and so on. But effectively, after 15 years, presumably, the Iranian program, um, the kind of limitations that have been imposed on it in terms of amount of uranium that can be enriched, as well as the kind of centrifuges that can be used, you know, whether they can go to more advanced, will be lifted. What will not be lifted is um, the very intrusive inspection regime. Okay, what people do not understand is that Iran, unlike, for example, India, Pakistan, Israel, and now North Korea, is part of the non-proliferation treaty, mm -hmm. has signed it, and through this agreement has also signed what is called an additional protocol that essentially um, allows the IAEA to hold, uh, to sort of um, uh, maintain oversight over the whole chain of of uh, uh, um, um, energy development, uh, nuclear energy development. So the IAEA is present, you know, at uranium mines, you know, and can count, you know, exactly how much has been taken out, out of that, how much has been turned into yellow cake, how much has been turned into enriched uranium. You know, it's very, very difficult in this process too. And that inspection regime is part and parcel of what Iran has agreed to as a member of um, MPT that has signed uh, or at least voluntarily implementing what is called the additional protocol. There are countries that are enriching, like mm -hmm. Brazil, that mm -hmm. have not signed. Mm -hmm. um, so the additional protocol. The additional yeah. protocol. They have signed what the is NPT. called they say, the yeah. safeguard yeah. agreement. Yeah. So IEA does go, but you know, after a while, people realize, especially after what happened, for example, in North Korea and so on, um, because North Korea was part of MPT and then pulled out, um, uh, that safeguards are not enough. Mm -hmm. And therefore, additional protocols are a way of increasing the, the inspection regime. And Iran is voluntarily implementing it and has promised that if Iran's um, um, uh, situation or file becomes normalized, that is to say Iran does not remain the only country that IAEA picks on, you know, uh, then eventually um, additional protocol and joining of additional protocol will go to the Iranian parliament and they will vote to per make it permanent. But mm. for now, uh, is in effect. Yeah. So it's uh, interesting, like you have, uh, for instance, um, Pakistan, uh, India, North Korea that pulled out from the NPT. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Israel, that's the only one in the Middle East, um, only state. Middle Eastern state that has uh, nuclear weapons. Yes. Um, <laughs> and India and Pakistan never joined the MPT. No, 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 yeah. they never. Okay. Uh, and neither, uh, the, yeah. No, no, no. And Pakistan, uh, and technically, um, Israel doesn't have, uh, you know, it, it has an undeclared program right. because unlike India and Pakistan, um, uh, Israel has never tested. Uh, you know, so India and Pakistan have both tested, yes. therefore, uh, um, but what is, you know, fascinating is that, you know, there is an acknowledgement, I mean, even coming out through WikiLeaks yeah. um, um, documents, that the United States government is fully aware uh, that um, uh, Israel has uh, um, 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 nuclear bombs. It's the question of delivery. It's a different issue. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it bomb in the basement. Mm. But even more striking is the fact that India um, 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 has not joined the NPT, yeah, yeah. but mm -hmm. United States during the Obama administration, actually, and even prior to that, <clears throat> began a whole process of engagement, uh, you know, promoting and helping India 
um, you know, modernizes nuclear. Uh, yeah, even Bush. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. So it happened during the Bush administration, mm -hmm. and it has continued. So even though India is technically outside this global frame, every country mm -hmm. in the world has signed the NPT, its safeguard agreement. Um, there is also the reality that uh, um, other countries, including South Korea, including Egypt, have been caught um, engaged in much bigger violations of the safeguard agreement, not uh, the NPT itself. Um, um, uh, South Korea was caught actually enriching at very, very high, mm. high level. But, you know, it never became an issue. Mm. Um, so, you know, there is... Because through thing. U.S. states that yeah. uh, have been so engaged there is, in that. Yeah, and also there is the sense that Iran's nuclear program was um, um, essentially a pretext for United States to pursue its policy of containing Iran yeah. um, uh, because of this argument that Iran is a rising Middle East power and has, you know, wants to challenge other uh, regional powers as well as the United States in the region. Mm -hmm. And that is why even with, you know, after making this nuclear thing so big and, you know, constantly talking about it, you know, endlessly, um, um, once the agreement, you know, happened, um, you know, now there are other issues um, that people are upset about in re Iran's program. So immediately the United States complained about Iran's missile defense program mm -hmm. um, and wanted to put, you know, sanctions on Iran. It was, you know, United Nations didn't accept that. Uh, but uh, sanctioned because they said that it's outside the frame um, of um, um, the agreements. And uh, so the missile program, missile defense program became an issue. Um, um, and then, you know, uh, beyond that, Iran's support for uh, quote unquote terrorism because of its support for Hezbollah in Lebanon um, has always been an issue. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> there are all sorts of slew of. Um, uh, sanctions on Iran that are um, human rights based, mm -hmm. you know, and here's the United States, you know, yeah. um, a right. country that, you know, its allies in the region are Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And, Where uh, human rights are wonderful. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, um, uh, you know, or at this particular moment, what you see happening in Turkey is just, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, a NATO ally, mm. um, you know, um, effectively arresting the opposition. Everybody. The, everybody, yeah. everybody yeah. kicking, you know. And uh, so, and, you know, United States, um, you know, um, not doing, uh, not anything, doing yeah. anything, you know. Yeah, yeah, this so. is, uh, yeah, this is a good uh, <clears throat> um, time to, like, uh, switch gears. Uh, but... Uh, just before that, uh, regarding how like um, the state of Israel was always gunning for Iran and of course against the nuclear deal and creating all kinds of pressures on the Obama administration mm. to not enter into that deal. Mm. So could you say something about well, that so yeah. we can like be a segue into what's exactly. happening right now? Exactly. The Israelis now? actually played a game that I think eventually worked against them. Uh, and when I say Israelis, I mean, we are essentially talking about a particular government, mm. uh, Netanyahu's government in Israel, because there were opponents to this approach. So what Netanyahu did was essentially to magnify uh, the threat uh, that Iran's nuclear program posed to the existence of Israel. Um, now, um, the reality is uh, that throughout this whole process, the Iranians' official position has always been in relationship to Israel, that our missile defense program is a missile defense program. In a sense, it's a deterrence. If you hit us, we'll hit you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, and we need to have this in order to prevent you, who is constantly talking about the fact that um, if Iran does not abandon its program, we're going to attack Iran, uh, that we have this defense program in over there, you know, as a deterrence. Nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, um, 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 uh, Netanyahu played this game that, first of all, magnified Iran's nuclear program as an existential threat to Israel. And then 
um, um, made, created a benchmark in the sense uh, that, that existed initially in the United States, that under no circumstances Iran can have um, any enrichment program, not even one centrifuge running. Okay, that was the position. That was the initial position of United States as well. You know, um, um, that's why it did not negotiate in Iran with Iran in the first um, uh, um, 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 term of the George mm -hmm. Bush's pre mm -hmm. presidency. However, after a while, even George Bush realized that that is not. You cannot pressure Iran. You know, Iran's economy is just too big, and in the case of. Uh, uh, George Bush himself said, we have s sanctioned Iran so much that we have leveraged ourselves out, you know. And the Iranians were simply not going to give in on that issue. So the United States shifted its position from no enrichment to limited enrichment with an intrusive inspection regime. So Netanyahu took a hard line on that as well and said that is not an acceptable. So, um, um, you know, a co continued threatening of Iran as well as a very hard line stance about non-negotiation with, with Iran uh, created a very difficult position because it would have, you know, um, led to a situation of war if Netanyahu would accept, uh, would continue um, his way and the United States government accepted Netanyahu's position, they would keep sanctioning Iran, sanctioning Iran, sanctioning Iran until no oil uh, would be exported. The Iranians would, you know, given the fact that Iran does have some sort of a diversified economy, the economy would be hurt, but it would not bend completely on its knees, the Iranians would say no. So the end result of that would be war. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, war and it was the Israelis wanted the Americans to attack Iran. And mm -hmm. it wasn't only the Israelis, it was the Saudis yes. as well. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things that came out in the WikiLeaks was that the previous king said, you need to cut the head of the serpent. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the Obama, I mean, I, by late George Bush administration, um, having seen the disaster that had occurred in Iraq, um, 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 they decided that that was not the way to go. The U.S. military opposed that option. Um, and they decided that actually attacking Iran uh, might actually lead to or give Iran an incentive to withdraw from MPT because mm -hmm. MPT has this mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, condition that if your country, you know, under duress, mm -hmm. force majeure, you can mm -hmm. withdraw from NPT and, um, you know, um, uh, push uh, mm -hmm. for a, an expedited uh, weaponized program. And as, as I said, this whole Iran nuclear program has been around, you know, we've been talking about Iran's um, 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 a nuclear uh, weapons program since, you know, late 1980s, early 1990s. And no matter how stupid you consider the Iranians to be, you know, a country that has an advanced auto industry, a country that has, you know, builds its own, you know, uh, naval destroyers and so on, you know, eventually, you know, if they decide to do so, they can, you know, they build a nuclear weapon too. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, most analysts thought that attacking Iran would actually not result. Yeah, in and uh, it's interesting that uh, Israel uh, wanted the U.S. to fight its war, thinking okay. that uh, it would be spared from that war um, had it uh, occurred, you know, which was uh, something, uh, mm -hmm. you know, foolish at least uh, to say. Yeah. So. I want to put uh, a map to see where Iran is in the scheme of things regarding the region, yeah. the region being the Middle East, or some people call it Middle East and North Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, so just to see the uh, yellow part uh, yeah. up on the top is uh, uh, Iran. Okay, yeah. so Iran is squeezed between Iraq. Iraq and Turkey are to the west of Iran. Mm -hmm. And then Afghanistan and Pakistan are 
to the east, mm. and then you know, variety of Central Asian uh, uh, countries are to the top: Turkmenistan, mm. you know, Azerbaijan, and Armenia to the top. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously before the fall of Soviet Union, Soviet Union was next door, mm -hmm. uh, but that has changed. But you can see how strategically is located because below under it, Iran and Saudi Arabia are not neighbors, mm -hmm. but you know, you see the Persian Gulf uh, in the middle of them, in the southern part of that yellow cat that mm -hmm. is Iran. Um, and uh, you know, there is a small kink that you can see uh, on that map, which is um, the Hormoz Strait, Strait yeah. which is very mm -hmm. narrow. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, most, you know, quite a bit of oil uh, that comes from the Middle East um, passes you know, through there. Passes right? through mm -hmm. there, and uh, and you know you actually can see that Iran is um, geographically quite fortunate mm -hmm. because it not only has very large access to the Persian Gulf. For example, compare that to the access that Iraq, Iraq has, nothing, which is very hardly, uh, hardly. And that was one of the reasons for its attack against mm. Kuwait in 1991. Mm -hmm. But also, Iran also um, has uh, land um, uh, bordering, you know, the Oman Sea and mm. you know the Arabian Sea. So you know, it it is in the process of also. Um, developing, and that's where it needs quite a bit of investment from abroad yeah. to create ports that actually um, reduces its need mm -hmm. uh, on uh, the Strait of Hormuz, while Saudi Arabia um, does not have that option mm -hmm. unless yeah. you know it goes through the Red Sea. Yeah. The other, the other um, this uh, another map. Uh, <clears throat> of uh, Iran. Mm -hmm. So uh, give us some kind of demographics and so forth about so Iran. So Iran is a large country. Mm -hmm. um, um, is as lo in terms of population, is as large as Turkey, uh, a little bit slightly uh, smaller in terms of population than Egypt. I think Egypt has about 90 million mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah. Um, it has a higher birth rate. Iran has been able to control its birth rate and lower it significantly. Um, um, it has about 80 million people. Mm -hmm. So compare that to the surrounding countries. You know, for example, this Iraq. This is Iraq. Iraq, yeah. you know, which is in the 20s, you know, 26. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, we do not know how many people live in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> um, no, no, there yeah. is, you know, because Saudi yeah. Arabia has a large immigrant population mm -hmm. that comes to work there, and they have, you know, they have always inflated the number of people. They say around 26 million. People question that. Yeah. So um, between it, 19 and 26, that's the Number. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, you know, um, um, Iran is a large country. It has um, a lot of resources, extra, a lot of resources. Not only it has oil, um, is the second largest, uh, has the second largest reserve of natural gas. gas yeah. So in terms of fossil fuel, if you put oil and gas together in Iran, Iran becomes, um, has the largest uh, uh, reserves of fossil fuel in the world. You mm -hmm. know, Russia is first in terms of natural mm -hmm. gas. Iran is second. Um, oil, you know, Iran doesn't have as much. Uh, in fact, most uh, um, energy experts consider Iran to be a gas country, yes. not an yeah. oil country. Mm -hmm. uh, so that has allowed Iran, uh, because gas, you know, has a much more complicated um, 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 uh, process for it to be exported. You know, it's not like oil. You put mm -hmm. it in barrels and then ship it on, you know, mm -hmm. put it on ship. You need to have pipelines and so on. And you know, for years, since the Iranian Revolution, uh, the Americans have assiduously worked uh, to prevent any kind of gas pipeline to go mm -hmm. through Iran. <laughs> uh, so, you know, instead of, you know, coming. So uh, Iran, but inside Iran, you have this very, very sophisticated network or extensive network of gas. So almost all the cities, all the rural areas are run um, um, on gas, mm -hmm. you know, which is mm -hmm. a cleaner fuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that's, you know, so everything goes up to the neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. goes, you know, it goes and ends at the, you know, Pakistani border. It does export gas to Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, and has done so for years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, uh, but that is also 
you know, there has been problems in that because in Turkey there have been attempts to blow up those um, uh, pipelines and so on. There is also the reality that because Iran has been cash strapped and uh, foreign uh, investment strapped, uh, um, uh, you know, its joint fields, particularly one joint field that it has with Qatar. Um, you know, it's like the Qataris have been sipping it, you know, mm. and, you know, so um, today, as I suggested, there was a major agreement with Total, um, as well as the Chinese company, to uh, uh, develop the South part. Uh, South parts, uh, one of the phases, it's an important development because, you know, in these joint fields, the Iranians are very concerned that they are losing. Yeah. So the joint the, field, uh, for instance, because uh, there was a joint field uh, between like Kuwait and Iraq uh, that yeah. led to war. Yeah. But uh, so uh, where's the, that? Uh, the joint field is in the Persian Gulf, yes. in the Persian Gulf where Qatar is. is, is so, you know, um, uh, um, uh, the, Qatar, the Iraqi Kuwaiti joint field is an oil joint field. Yeah. Iranians and Iraqis yeah. also have a joint field right now that the Iraqis are um, uh, capitalizing on much yeah. faster than the Iranians. Yeah. And despite all the friendliness that exists between Iraq and Iran, that people expect that uh, that kind of, um, um, you know, um, to turn into conflict into the future. So, mm -hmm. but those are oil fields. Mm -hmm. These are yeah, gas yeah. fields no, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, um, um, the south part, the Qataris have what is called the north part of the field. The Iranians have the south part of it. Um, they There are 22 <laughs> phases that they are working on, even perhaps more. And some of the phases have been harder. Um, the French company Total was working there, uh, but then once the sanctions regime came, yeah. they pulled out. The Chinese moved in, but they, they again, you know, uh, were caught in the... Yeah, uh, <coughs> were not yeah it's in. interesting, like uh, another joint field in terms of, uh, you know, gas, but also oil is... Uh, <laughs> the one between the state of Israel and Absol Lebanon. Absolutely. And, uh, and Cyprus and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. Egypt too, you uh, know, yeah. it's, it's a whole... It's really, uh, but uh, the one that is like uh, creating some problems at this point is the one between Lebanon and the state of Israel. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, that. <clears throat> but uh, so like uh, the future uh, has a lot to do with, uh, you know, energy in terms of the Middle East, especially when countries that didn't have like oil before or gas or now mm. have like Lebanon is mm. a case Absolutely. in point yeah so that's like uh, for the future but also like there's uh, the question of water resources and so Absolutely. forth yeah Absolutely. so okay then uh, in terms of um, the US uh, and Iran now um, as regards to the question of um, um, the war Mm -hmm. against Daesh in Iraq. Daesh means ISIS, uh, mm -hmm. which is the terrorist organization. And in Syria, against ISIS also, that uh, mm -hmm. is uh, Daesh, Islamic State in um, Iraq and uh, Syria. Uh, plus uh, al Nusra, which is Al-Qaeda in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, how do you see these kind of well, things uh, playing? Okay, so... Uh, Iran's position in relationship to both Iraq and Syria is essentially the same. They are supporting, you know, their argument is that they are supporting the central government, the government that is um, um, accepted uh, by United Nations as the government of both those countries. And they, they are against any kind of splitting of the territory in any of these two countries, mm -hmm. okay? So, in Iraq, uh, that position is very similar to United States. That is to say, the United States and Iran are both uh, supportive of the central government of Mr. Ahadi. Uh, they are both fighting, you know, especially after what happened in Mosul when suddenly um, ISIL or Daesh took over that city. So right now, where there is a very strong move on the part of the Iraqi government supported by the Americans through air attacks to take back Mosul, the Iranians are also on the field in order to help 
um, um, militias, Shiite militias. So the concern essentially is whether or not those Shiite militias will ultimately either undermine the central authority of the government or they end up engaging in retribution against uh, um, uh, you know, Sunni groups that are also fighting there, either on the side of ISIL or um, um, helping. So it, it's a very complicated situation, but nevertheless, Iranians and Americans are not directly talking to each other, but their relationship is being mediated by a government that is friendly mm -hmm. to both mm -hmm. sides. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and in Syria, the situation is different, obviously. Uh, before we go to Syria, if you don't mind, okay. um, in terms of Iraq, uh -huh. uh, for instance, there's this uh, popular mobiliz mobilization um, group, I mean, exactly. you know, army, let's uh -huh. say. Uh, but uh, this one, primarily Shia. It is primarily but Shia. But there are Christians, there are Kurds, there are absolutely, Sunnis. There absolutely, absolutely. You know, all kinds of other. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And Iran plays an advisory role, mm -hmm. but because within that group, one of those organizations, or at least the organization that has um, um, a, a prominent role, um, essentially finds its origins as an opposition group inside Iran, you know, uh, it used to be called Supreme uh, yeah, Council, uh, yeah. Council of mm -hmm. Islamic Resistance. Yeah. Now it's called Iraqi uh, so, um, yeah. um, um, Resistance Group, mm -hmm. um, 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 the Hakim family. Yeah, yeah. Because um, that is closely connected to Iran, there is this interpretation given that all this whole organization is controlled by Iran, which is really, not, really not, not true. true. No. Um, uh, I, you know, the Iranians wished, mm -hmm. you know, if they could control Iraq, you know, Amer in the same way Americans <laughs> wish they could control yeah. Iraq or and Iraqis. Uh, but they are playing, you know, an important role, the famous Iranian general, you know, uh, Sardar Soleimani is always on the ground. What is significant here in Iraq, and it plays itself in a different way in Syria, mm -hmm. is because Iran has effectively been under a very tight sanctions regime um, and has been forced to rely on its own domestic arms industry. Um, Iran really does not have a very well-developed conventional um, uh, uh, capabilities. So you you don't find Iran you don't find Iranian air force yeah, going and right. uh, you know it's the Americans who mm -hmm. are doing it. Um, Syria has it. You know Assad government constantly uses its air force because it's supported by the Russian Russia. and developed an air force. Iran really doesn't have. Um, a very well developed conventional military. Uh, Saudi Arabia is constantly bombing Yemen in that mm -hmm. issue, but Iran cannot. So, how do they do it? They either send advisory uh, groups, you know, um, generals that have uh, for years learned to be on the front line themselves, mm -hmm. literally, they mm -hmm. go on front line. Or they rely, you know, they develop these militia groups that. Given the nature of the relationship Iran has as the center of the Shiite world, or Shiite, some of them come from Afghanistan, some of them mm -hmm. come mm -hmm. from Pakistan, and so on. What distinguishes these uh, militia groups that Iran has created from the militia groups that the Saudis or the Qataris have mm -hmm. uh, funded mm -hmm. is that these Shiite groups do not challenge come back and threaten Iran itself. You know, it's not, you know, they don't, the, Iran has not created an Al-Qaeda or, you know, given birth to an Al-Qaeda or an ISIS that then comes and becomes a competitor for power mm -hmm. and a danger to the security mm -hmm. of the countries that have given birth to it. Um, so that dynamic has created a situation where the Iranian militia groups, even though they are supported by Iran, are, you know, touted as um, uh, 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 groups that just constantly say yeah. yes to Iran yeah. and are completely yeah, also controlled Also, like uh, by Iran. in Yemen, uh, the Saudis uh, use uh, mercenaries beyond those guys. Absolutely, too. Yeah. absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, what we're, you know, um, uh, 
Al Nusra, you know, for example, was supported initially by uh, the Qataris, you know. So um, the same argument is made that, you know, the origins of ISIS in Iraq goes back to the intelligence services of Saddam's regime that went rogue and then obviously eventually began to get funded because the Saudis have never come to terms with the reality of what happens in Iraq and the way it flipped from mm -hmm. being an ally, um, um, you know, although a secular one with the Sunni Arab world, um, you know, it flipped and it changed leadership mm -hmm. and the majority Shiite yeah, uh, became, yeah, yeah. became dominant. So the Saudis have never uh, come to terms with mm -hmm. that. And they have blamed the Iranians for yeah. it, okay? <laughs> uh, in reality, of course, the Iranians had nothing to do mm. uh, with the invasion um, um, of uh, Iraq by the mm. United States yeah, in yeah, 2003. Sure. Uh, it's interesting here, like, uh, you know, just go back a little bit. <clears throat> that um, in a sense, and we talked about this in previous um, uh, programs, that uh, the U.S. Um, basically um, in its role in Iran and Afghanistan helped, uh, I mean in Iraq and Afghanistan, helped Iran mm -hmm. in, in getting rid of uh, competitors. Uh, exactly, you know, uh, exactly. So could you say a little bit well, about this uh, as regards to what's happening right now? Uh, well, right now, um, um, Afghanistan is an interesting dynamic because mm -hmm. Afghanistan, obviously, Taliban, you know, um, is still very present, but uh, there is also a concern that ISIS is making mm -hmm. inroads yes. in yeah. Afghanistan. Um, so the Iranians, who historically have been very much at odds with uh, um, Taliban, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, you know, out of self-interest, you know, because Taliban and ISIS are not. ISIS is extremely anti Shiite, anti-Iranian. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is a possibility that the Iranians are making or are making an attempt to sort of connect a little bit to Taliban. You know, you know the real, you know the map that you know you showed, you know shows the reality of a country like Iran that is surrounded. Yeah, we have it um, again. Oh. If we can show okay. it, so what are uh, we talking? Uh, it's totally yeah. surrounded by countries that are extremely unstable at this particular right. moment. So the Iranians essentially. Um, make the argument that in order for these forces, which they also have come to call terrorist forces, not to come into Iran, mm -hmm. they have to project power outside mm -hmm. and go and fight outside of Iran. So, but in Afghanistan, again, like in Iraq, mm -hmm. Iran and United States are essentially pursuing similar policies. Mm -hmm. They want to um, 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 strengthen the central government, Okay, and in fact, in the uh, um, um, uh, uh, Afghan uh, elections where there was a contest between mm -hmm. two presidential candidates, both the Iranians and the Americans worked not together separately, but essentially pursuing the same mm -hmm. um, 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 uh, goal, uh, leading to some sort of a compromise agreement between the two leading candidates. Yeah, right, right. So, it, uh, so a lot of people essentially have argued that the United States and Iran have very similar interests in several countries in the region. And those interests are very much at odds with the interests of the Israelis as well as the Saudis. But because of this long-standing relationship that the United States has with these two countries, it is unable to shake itself from uh, the kind of commitment that it continues to have to these two countries. You know, United States has absolutely no interest to fight the Houthis in Yemen and yeah. bomb the poorest country into in the Middle East, into but, um, um, yeah. even more poverty, right. hunger, yeah. and so on. But get it, the green light to the Saudis to do uh, so. Not <laughs> only, you know, green light yeah. and um, helps them, you yeah, know, yeah, in yeah. some way. Yeah. And part of the Military reason, stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and part of the reason that it does is essentially the argument that it's, uh, it has made literally publicly that we have to hold Saudi's hands so they would not be too upset at us for making a nuclear agreement with Iran. You know, I kind of don't buy this thing. Well, yeah. but you yeah. know, 
It's a ridiculous argument, whether you buy it or not. It's a ridiculous argument for a superpower to make, you know. That's and why I don't it's, buy it. Yeah, it's a, but anyway, but you know, when you look at the situation, what does, what kind of interest United, mm. uh, in terms of U.S. interest is served mm. if the, um, um, who, you know, the dynamic that is at play. Now, the situation completely changes when we move to Syria. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, the Iranian government, along with the Russians, have taken side of the um, 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 Syrian government. They make an argument that um, uh, we are there legally because the government has asked us to be here. Um, uh, while, um, you know, obviously, United States policy, once uh, demonstrations began against Assad's regime, has been that they want to overthrow the Assad's regime. They know at this particular moment that they can't do that. But um, so the policy has been sort of half-hearted in the sense that they are still giving support to um, 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 rebel groups that they call moderate groups. It's a combination of Arab and Kurdish forces. Um, um, yet at the same time, um, they are also fighting ISIS uh, mm. there. So in that, they are... Uh, their interest is similar to Iran, but in terms of their position on the government, it's opposite. So United States policy has in Syria has become totally incoherent. Um, and, you know, you must have heard that at some point groups that were um, uh, um, uh, trained by the CIA were fighting uh, um, against groups that were trained <laughs> by uh, Department of Defense. You yeah, know, yeah, that yeah. essentially, you know, um, but really, uh, the incoherence of the policy notwithstanding, the reality is that the continued support, albeit insufficient support for the rebel groups to overthrow Assad's regime, has had the effect of, and not putting pressure on countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and so on, to stop the flow of um, arms and funding for these organizations, has had the effect of lengthening uh, the Syrian conflict. Yeah. Now, um, Assad is, you know, uh, is a brutal dictator, is killing, you know, but the policy that is being pursued is not going to, uh, because of the support that the Russians and the Iranians have chosen to give the Assad, as well as Assad's own um, support within the country, has prevented his collapse. Yeah. Uh, so the end result has been the continuation of a conflict um, um, uh, through supports by countries like United States, Saudi Arabia, and so on, that everybody knows will not end up overthrowing Assad. Yeah. It's, it's interesting now, uh, I mean, to continue with that, uh, what's happening right now uh, in Syria, northern Syria, mm -hmm. and then uh, the Americans saying that um, the Kurds uh, we go into Raqqa. Raqqa, uh, which is the capital uh, of ISIS. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, uh, that's where they had yeah, the quarters of, of, uh, of, I, of ISIS, of Daesh. Yeah, so it's uh, interesting. So uh, what do you hear about that in terms of Iranian-U.S. Um, respective relations with Turkey and mm. uh, in okay. terms of the Kurds, um, Kurdish troops, uh, mm. uh, Syrian Kurdish troops. Uh, okay. uh, uh, no Arabs... Uh, with those guys at this point to go to Raqqa, only yeah. Kurdish. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, I had heard that they were some Arab forces too, but you know, no, I, you no. know, if they are not. Maybe later on. Yeah. But anyway, now. this yeah. is an area that the Americans, the Turks, this is, as you say, northern Syria. Mm -hmm. It's an arena where the Russians, the Iranians, and the Syrians are effectively not there. Their focus is in other places. Mm -hmm. Their focus is in Aleppo. So United States is effectively at war in Syria, bombing Syria through, you know, from air, mm. in the same way that the Russians are doing, mm -hmm. you know, but it's going to be in the city of Raqqa to give support to these forces to come back. Now, the problem here is that um, Raqqa is placed, you know, near Ruf Euphrates. Mm. You know, you have the Kurdish forces coming, mm -hmm. you know, Syrian Kurdish forces coming, mm. people who uh, liberated the city or fought in the city yeah. of Kobani. Yeah. They are coming from the north. I have a map of Syria as okay. we go. No, you, you go okay. ahead. Um, uh, we'll while the it. Turks mm. are coming mm. from 
um, um, you know, from um, the south side. And the Kurdish forces are in a much better position to uh, position to um, move into Raqqa than the Turkish forces. Yeah. It's much longer, uh, the path that they have to take. You see the Euphrates, yeah. and then you can see Raqqa in the middle. So you can yeah. see where they are coming from the north, um, um, the Kurdish forces. So there is a moment where these two forces might face each other and end up fighting each other. Yeah. Because as you know, um, Turkey is going through its own highly contentious anti-Kurdish um, 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 phase, you mm -hmm. know, Turkey goes through mm -hmm. these phases and, uh, you know, major politicians, Kurdish politicians, opposition have been arrested. They are very concerned that Syrian Kurds would create their own autonomous region. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, uh, they want to make sure and the impact that that will have on the Kurdish population. Um, in um, um, uh, in Turkey, Turkey is engaged in a similar um, military maneuvering in Iraq as well. Yes, uh, yeah. near the city of Mosul. Um, but they have been blocked. They have no. been blocked, but they, you know, they, they, they are, are not. There. They are yeah. there. Yeah. You know, the the Iraqi government says, you know, you have no business being here, mm. and Erdogan tells the Iraqi government, you know, um, how rude of you to tell me <laughs> I shouldn't be yeah. here. I have a right yeah. to be here. I, I don't know if you heard. Uh, Erdogan appointed uh -huh. two governors, uh -huh. one for Aleppo one for <laughs> and one for Mosul. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's like the Ottoman yeah. kind of. Uh, Exactly, ADC, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, but you know that dynamic creates a, a potentially explosive dynamic. Mm -hmm. Even you know, let us say within the Kurdish regional government that exists in uh, um, uh, Iraq, it creates a potentially explosive dynamic because, as you know, um, uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan there are different groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and you know at this particular moment. Um, um, the Kurdish regional government leader, Mr. Barzani, is siding with the Turks, but other groups are not. And that is a, essentially a potentially yeah. um, a dangerous dynamic that might yeah, come Yeah, people into think like, you know, in the uh, <clears throat> regional government of uh, Kurdistan in Iraq that uh, they are all united. That's no, not they true. Not. The They're Taliban... Uh, Talibani, Talibani, Talibani yeah. not Taliban of yeah, Afghanistan, exactly. but Talibani. Patriotic Union. Uh, Jalal al Talibani uh, is uh, opposed to uh, yeah, Barazani. There are, there are, there are and they would some, fight with uh, yeah, among yeah, they each used other, to yeah. fight. They, mm. they had, they effectively had a civil war, yeah. um, um, and, you know, a while back. Mm -hmm. But that's not happening. They also have mm. other groups, and yeah. you know that you know Talibani is very close to Iran. Yeah. That group is very close to Iran. Uh, so it's the reality of the situation. In, you know, but the Barzani government um, has allowed the Saudis to give support to Iranian Kurdish group to make forays into Iran. So today, for example, the Iranian, you know, the Iranians are threatening Mr. Mm -hmm. Barzani um, um, that he should stop doing that. Um, um, the reality is that um, Iraqi Kurdistan is a landlocked place. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, even if he wants to go independence, in terms of the amount of oil that it has, it is really not um, uh, as significant as what uh, Iraq... He would be sanctioning himself, sanctioning yeah, himself. Exactly, I mean, where exactly, would he sell it? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Not, it's not the question. Yeah. It's just that the yeah. amount of oil, yeah, yeah. The, the percentage that the Iraqi Kurdistan would get from, you know, four million barrel extra oil yeah. that will be produced eventually in Iraq would be much higher than mm -hmm. the limited That's amount right. that yeah. uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan would have. And it would be a very, very bad bet to sort mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, have a good relationship with um, uh, Turkey, but have a bad relationship with Iran, mm -hmm. given the geography. Mm -hmm. Um, um, uh, of the area, so it's yeah. it's uh, that area is also quite contentious. Right, um, we have like less than a minute left, uh, so uh, I'm I'm interested in the question of like Turkey and U.S. relationship um, um, with Turkey, given what's happening in Turkey now. I mean, it could go into like a civil war. I mean, it's moving in that direction. We don't know if it's gonna happen or not, but. The potential is right there. So, how would you see, like Iran, um, 
well, you know, Iran, positioning itself. Okay, well. Iran immediately positioned itself against the coup. Yeah. Okay, so it was the first country, you know, and yeah. sort of acted as though United yeah. States yeah. was involved in the coup. I would see uh, that, you know, Turkey for United States is becoming increasingly like Pakistan for United mm -hmm. States, mm -hmm. a country that they don't know what to do, yet at the same time they have to maintain. The Iranians and the Turks, on the other hand, uh, you know, do not necessarily get along, but they have strong commercial mm -hmm. relationship yep. that I think it is to both countries' okay. relationship to we maintain. Are, we're uh, flat out of time. Thank okay. you very much uh, okay. for uh, coming and sharing your views. Okay. And uh, thank you for watching. And we'll see you in December. Aloha and mahalo nuwiloa.